Look back at man's struggle for freedom. Trace our present day's strength to its source, and you'll find that man's pathway to glory is strewn with the bones of a horse. Hello, I'm Kent Masterson Brown, and welcome to Unsung Hero, the horse in the Civil War. Of all the thousands of volumes written about the American Civil War, precious few have ever addressed the role of the horse. The horse pulled and carried the armies and enabled them to maneuver on battlefields. Without the horse, there could have been no armies. Millions of horses campaigned and many died, like the men who rode and managed them. Here is their story. It is one of fortitude, loyalty, and heroism. The number of horses utilized in the Union and Confederate armies absolutely defies enumeration. Every branch of service, infantry, cavalry, and artillery relied upon vast numbers of horses. The Union Army of the Potomac, commanded by General George G. Meade, and General Robert E. Lee's Confederate Army of Northern Virginia were at their peak strengths of 100,000 and 75,000 combatants, respectively, in the summer of 1863. Each army had in excess of 60,000 horses and mules to pull their wagon trains and artillery batteries and to mount their cavalrymen and officers. So vast were those armies that if stretched out on the roads, they each extended for more than 90 miles. At the height of their respective strengths, those two armies each had between 6,000 and 7,000 wagons in their quartermaster, subsistence, ordnance, and ambulance wagon trains. Each wagon was pulled by four horse or six horse or mule teams, making the total number of horses and mules pulling the supplies of each of those armies in excess of 35,000 in number. In both armies, mules were predominantly used to pull the supply wagons. Each horse and mule was expected to pull nearly 700 pounds, the whole team pulling 4,200 pounds. Lee's wagon trains presented breathtaking spectacles. One citizen of Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, observed those wagon trains just before Lee began his retreat from Gettysburg. The great preponderating impression which was made upon the mind by looking upon them, the citizen recalled, was their immenseness. No idea of their magnitude can be formed by any description which can be given. The supply wagons in Meade's Union Army were over 50 miles in length when that army entered Pennsylvania in the summer of 1863. The appearance of Meade's wagon trains would have been similar to those in this famous photograph of a Union wagon train entering Petersburg, Virginia in early April, 1865. Lee's supply trains were more than 57 miles long when his army retreated out of Pennsylvania. Beyond the horses and mules used to pull the supply wagons, vast numbers of horses were employed in the two mounted arms of those armies, the cavalry and the artillery. General Meade's Union Cavalry Corps consisted of three divisions, totaling over 12,000 mounted cavalrymen in all. Lee's army had a cavalry division of six brigades totaling nearly 12,000 mounted troopers. 
The field artillery accompanying both armies was drawn by horses and in the Confederate Army by mules to a large degree, as is evidenced by this remarkable photograph of a wrecked Confederate limber at Gettysburg and a dead mule nearby. To pull all the guns and caissons of one Union artillery battery of six guns required 72 horses. In addition to the horses pulling the guns and caissons, artillery batteries had their own horse-drawn blacksmith forges, horse-drawn baggage, quartermaster, subsistence and ordnance wagons, as well as horse-drawn ambulances. In all, each Union artillery battery had nearly 130 horses. There were 51 artillery batteries in George Meade's Union Army. The total number of horses serving in the artillery service of that army exceeded 10,000. Add the horses of the field grade officers of the nearly 240 infantry regiments and the horses of the generals and their staffs of the army itself and the generals and staffs of each of the Army's components and the total number of horses and mules in the Union Army of the Potomac reached more than 60,000. The numbers of horses and mules in Lee's Confederate Army of Northern Virginia were similar to its Union counterpart, over 60,000 in number. Thus, when the two armies faced one another for three days at Gettysburg in early July 1863, more than 120,000 horses and mules were on the battlefield or in support positions behind the lines. Of course, General Meade's Union Army and General Lee's Confederate Army were not the only armies that fought in the Civil War or even in the Eastern theater of war. There were enormous armies facing one another in the Western theater of war, in Kentucky, Tennessee, Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, Georgia, the Carolinas, and the Trans-Mississippi. All those armies employed vast numbers of horses and mules, anywhere from 40 to 60,000 in each army. In some, millions of horses and mules were utilized by the Union and Confederate armies during the four years of conflict. One of the reasons the wagon trains of the armies were so long was the need to carry the forage necessary to feed the horses and mules. Army regulations in the Union and Confederate armies set the forage ration at 14 pounds of hay and 12 pounds of oats, corn, or barley for each horse each day. For the mules, the forage ration was 14 pounds of hay and nine pounds of oats, corn, and barley. To comply with the regulations, each army commander had to make sure that those rations were fed to each one of the more than 40 to 60,000 horses and mules in his army each and every day. It was an impossible task. When General Meade pursued Lee after Gettysburg, his army's supply wagons were more than 20 miles to his rear. His horses had not been properly fed or shod for days before the battle ended. Those supply trains were never able to link up with the army until seven days after the battle ended. By the time Meade's army reached Frederick, Maryland on July 8 and 9, just 30 miles south of Gettysburg, it had lost 15,000 horses to malnutrition and incapacity. Meade repeatedly requested the Quartermaster General Montgomery Meigs to send him more horses. The horses still attached to artillery batteries, Meade wrote, were so weak due to lack of forage, they couldn't even pull the guns. 
Meade's army was on the brink of falling apart. As the war progressed, the armies on both sides faced ever increasing difficulties getting forage to their horses and mules. There were problems with steel. Um, as in most wars, there was always been shortages for metal, but there were problems with horseshoes as well. Now, the problem was getting the shoes to the troops. Again, breaking supply lines, getting through the logistics of weather and whatnot, getting them there. Now, if you've got 60,000 horses, and each horse wears four shoes, and each horse needs to be reshod eight, nine, ten times a year, we're talking about close to 2.3 million horseshoes per year needed to be supplied to these regiment farriers. A lot of the issues had to do with just pure logistics. And so just a matter of getting feed to them was a big problem. Since they were moving across the country, their, their feed sources weren't reliable. They had problems with the supply lines uh, always being broken and getting backed up with everything from ammunition to food for the troops and including food for horses. So destitute was central in Northern Virginia by the summer of 1863 that Lee's army could not only not obtain supplies of hay and grains from the Confederate government, it could not subsist in Virginia as there were no crops or grazing grasses within 30 miles of the army. Lee's horses were subsisting on less than three pounds of grains a day, if at all. Many were shoeless. That destitution in Virginia was the principal reason why Lee invaded Pennsylvania in June and July, 1863. In Southern Pennsylvania, a region untouched by the war, Lee found fodder crops at their peak. Once across the Potomac River, Lee directed quartermasters to purchase, impress, and even confiscate all the fodder crops they could find. While the army was in Pennsylvania, horses could graze. There is uh, documentation that the army was given orders to uh, take the uh, coal, which was uh, also difficult uh, to get on a regular basis, uh, take the horseshoe nails and any other uh, consumable supplies that they would use. Horses were seized. Lee may have obtained more than 20,000 horses while in Pennsylvania. After three weeks of foraging, Lee's supply wagon trains reached an amazing 57 miles in length. The invasion of Pennsylvania was, in large measure, an effort by Lee to save the horses and mules in his army and to procure as many replacements as possible. The armies in the Western theater of war faced even more difficult circumstances than those in the East. Some of the armies west of the Appalachian Mountains campaigned across nine different states. When General Braxton Bragg's Confederate Army of the Mississippi invaded Kentucky in September and October 1862, the campaign began at Tupelo, Mississippi. There, the troops boarded railroad trains to Mobile, Alabama. From Mobile, the troops took trains to Atlanta, Georgia, and Chattanooga, Tennessee. The cavalry, artillery, and supply wagons crossed northern Alabama to reach Chattanooga. From Chattanooga, Bragg's army marched into Kentucky. Altogether, Bragg's army traveled more than 1,000 miles just to get into central Kentucky. The march was made worse by the fact that the entire region was in the midst of a three-month drought. While in Kentucky, Bragg's army foraged just like Lee's army did in Pennsylvania. To retreat out of Kentucky, Bragg's army marched another 700 miles through southeastern Kentucky, passed through Cumberland Gap, and marched to Knoxville, Tennessee. From Knoxville, the army marched to Murfreesboro, just east of Nashville. In all, Bragg's army journeyed nearly 2,000 miles in less than three months. The toll taken on the army's horses and mules 
was staggering. Throughout the time Bragg campaigned in Kentucky, he had no base of supply in his rear. He relied entirely upon foraging to keep his men and his horses and mules alive. Fast moving cavalry raids also took a toll on horses. General George Stoneman's raid into southeastern Virginia in April 1863 was a near disaster. His entire cavalry division was without hay for 21 days, causing horses to become incapacitated at alarming rates. Union General Philip Sheridan's march from Winchester, Virginia to Petersburg in February and March of 1865 was accomplished by requiring each trooper to actually carry 30 pounds of forage across the saddle of his horse. In a subsequent raid just before Appomattox, General Sheridan's horses suffered terribly due to the involuntary change of forage from oats to corn. Three-fourths of Sheridan's horses became lame just because of that change of diet. Union Colonel Benjamin H. Grierson's famous cavalry raid from LaGrange, Tennessee to Baton Rouge, Louisiana in the spring of 1863 provided an example of how horses were driven to the limit of their endurance. Grierson's command averaged 50 miles a day. It covered 600 miles in 16 straight days. The last 76 miles were covered in less than 36 hours. The command started with fresh horses at the rear of the long column. When a horse began to break down, the trooper stepped aside, dropping the horse to a walk. When fresh horses at the rear of the column passed, the trooper swapped the saddle from the broken down horse to the fresh one, leaving the old horse in the road. He could have, have had a very severe injury. Um, it could just be work uh, to exhaustion. He could have uh, a ruptured a tendon. If a horse was blown, he was, um, you know, he was done for a while. Uh, not that he couldn't be rehabilitated, but a lot of times the effort that it took to bring a blown horse back wasn't worth it. So they might just leave them behind or maybe make a, a, a trade for some new animals. Grierson's raid was followed by a raid conducted by Confederate General John Hunt Morgan's cavalry division of mostly Kentucky regiments that began in late June 1863 at Carthage, Tennessee, completely traversed Kentucky, and crossed the Ohio River into Indiana. Morgan's Kentuckians loved their horses. Most of their mounts were those they brought into the war from their farms. Once in Indiana, Morgan's men and their horses raced across southern Indiana and Ohio until they were finally run down by Union cavalry forces in East Central Ohio at Buffington Island on the Ohio River. Morgan's men and their beloved horses had covered more than 1,100 miles in less than one month. Impressment teams operating on either side of the column seized every horse they could find for remounts. Saddles had remained on the backs of the horses almost continually, opening terrible sores. By the time the raid ended in late July, the entire division had been remounted with impressed horses, some troopers obtaining more than one horse along the way. In spite of the widespread use of boots that reached to Morgan's men's thighs, the inside of their legs were completely broken open due to the constant rubbing in the saddles, a condition the troopers referred to as being busted. In the end, Nearly all of the 2,600 horses in Morgan's command when the raid began had become disabled, incapacitated, or died. A New York cavalryman described a long cavalry march. The cavalrymen continue on a march for many days and nights in succession, as on a raid, averaging at least 65 miles in 24 hours, with little water 
and less forage. Unable to remove the saddle which has to be tightly bound until the animal is so badly galled that the hair comes off with the blanket at its first removal. Sufferings like these often cause the death of a large proportion of the horses of a command. And to a careless looker on, these things would appear to be mere neglects. But these cruel military necessities only develop more perfectly the rider's sympathy for his suffering beast and bind them in closer and more endearing bonds. One Confederate cavalryman described the end of a long day in the saddle. The cavalryman was in touch with his horse 18 hours out of 24. In the other six hours, he was usually close enough to mount at a moment's warning. And much of the time, while in Pennsylvania, the men slept with their horses tied to their wrists. While the rider slept, the horse cropped the grass around him as far out as his tether would allow him and as close up to his rider's body as he could get. I have seen men by the thousands lying in this manner. On the way to Gettysburg, we had halted for a rest at Delaplaine, Virginia. Having no food for our horses, we were ordered to turn them loose in the fields to graze. It was 10 o'clock at night. The hungry animals went briskly to work, satisfying their hunger. The grinding of their many jaws sounded like the, the muffled roar of a, a distant cataract. And this was the music that lulled the weary men to sleep as they lay scattered over the fields without any fear of being hurt or trodden upon. Horses and mules in the artillery service suffered terribly. Artillery batteries formed on the battlefield alongside the infantry regiments they supported. Behind the guns were the limbers with the horses attached by harness to the tongues of the limbers facing the guns. Behind the limbers were the caissons attached to limbers with the horses attached by harness to the tongues of the limbers also facing the guns. Immediately behind the six guns in Union batteries were 72 horses all facing the enemy. Immediately behind the four guns of Confederate batteries were 48 horses, all facing the enemy. In the midst of the artillery batteries, the commissioned officers directed the cannoneers while mounted. The horses were completely exposed to enemy fire and literally watched the shells being fired at them, unable to move. To explode shells over and among the horses of an artillery battery, killing or maiming as many as possible, was one of the means of crippling or immobilizing the guns. In Lieutenant Alonzo H. Cushing's Battery A, 4th United States Artillery at the Angle at Gettysburg on July 3rd, 29 battery horses were killed and 36 horses were wounded by enemy fire. And all six guns, all of the limbers, and most of the caissons were destroyed. Cushing himself was killed. That was the price paid for turning back General George E. Pickett's famed Division of Virginians. Cushing was finally awarded the Medal of Honor in March 2010, the steadfastness and bravery of his horses being a major reason for the award. A Confederate cannoneer described the chaos when Union artillery fire struck his own Charlottesville artillery battery at Gettysburg. Never before or after did I see guns in such a condition of wreck and destruction as this battalion was. It had been hurled backward, as it were. Weight and impact of metal. Guns dismounted and disabled. Carriages splintered and crushed. Ammunition chests exploded. Limbers upset. Wounded horses plunging and kicking, dashing out the brains of the men tangled in the harness. While cannoneers with pistols were crawling around through the wreck, shooting the struggling horses to save the lives of the wounded men. One Union veteran remembered the plight of horses on the battlefield in poetry. All the men lie still, as is the way of dead or silent bleed, waiting good helper, be it angel death. But here and there, a horse rages piteously in that blind way of beast who knows alone of its hard agony. 
You've heard that scream from wounded horse. It is the sorest cry in this shamed earth of battle. Horses and mules were obtained for the Union Army by the use of purchase agents who entered into contracts for the supply of those animals. Early in the war, most horses were brought in from the West in railroad carloads. In the summer of 1861, it was reported that at least 2,000 horses were brought into Washington, D.C. each and every day. During the first two years of the war, 284,000 horses were furnished to the Union cavalry alone, even though the maximum number of cavalrymen in the field did not exceed 60,000. With large amounts of horses anywhere, of course, veterinarians always worry about diseases. Um, so they were fighting disease outbreaks and mostly, more than anything, fatigue. These horses were moving miles and miles each day and they would wear out. They would get uh, simple injuries that without adequate care and rest could be uh, life-threatening, especially in a battle. You know, getting horses and procurement of horses was, was always a big problem. Uh, there were people here in Kentucky, for example, there were people that had big mule farms that would regularly sell to the army. But these were far and few between, and sometimes there's a big dry spell between a, somebody that could supply good fresh horses or mules and, uh, and the next spot. So uh, that was always a problem, um, getting fresh horses. And, you know, if you don't have fresh horses, you got to go on, you know, you'll, you'll run the tires off your Jeep if necessary. Sore back was common. Cavalry troopers and artillerymen learned to take better care of their horses than themselves. They frequently walked alongside their horses to give them a break on long rides. They would water and feed their horses before they'd feed themselves. Rehabilitating broken down horses and mules was absolutely necessary, but very difficult to achieve. Cavalry commands on both sides often improvised setting up rehabilitation depots distant from the field of action to allow horses to be restored with proper feeding, medical attention, and rest. The Union Army established a cavalry bureau in 1863. That bureau established six principal depots solely for the rehabilitation of cavalry horses at Geeseboro, District of Columbia, St. Louis, Greenville, Indiana, Nashville, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and Wilmington, Delaware. The principal depot at Geeseboro, District of Columbia, was situated on the north bank of the Potomac River below Washington, D.C. It was 625 acres in size with stables, stockyards, forage houses, and wharves. By August 12, 1863, provisions were made for 15,000 horses. Within three months, arrangements were made for 30,000 horses. The Union Army burned through horses at an alarming rate. In 1864, the United States Army purchased 190,000 horses and added 20,000 more from capture. During the first eight months of 1864, the entire United States Cavalry Force needed remounting twice that required more than 40,000 horses for each remounting. The life expectancy of a horse by then was four months. Each and every rider needed at least three horses each year. General Sheridan's Union Cavalry in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia required 150 remounts each day. In the end, 
more than 1,500,000 horses and mules died in the service of both sides. Millions more were maimed or broken down. General Ulysses S. Grant was a magnificent horseman, and he knew great horses when he saw them. Grant acquired a black horse at the plantation of Joseph Davis, President Jefferson Davis's brother, near Vicksburg, Mississippi. Grant named the horse Jeff Davis, and he rode it through the rest of the war. After the Battle of Chattanooga in November 1863, Grant went to St. Louis. He was critically ill with dysentery. While in St. Louis, he received a letter from a gentleman named S.S. Grant. General Grant called on the gentleman who told him that he had a horse he wanted to give him, knowing Grant's love of fine horses. Promising to always care for the horse, Grant was given a charger he named Cincinnati. Grant would ride Cincinnati through the rest of the war and would keep him until the horse died in 1878. Cincinnati was the son of Lexington, the fastest four-mile thoroughbred in the United States at seven minutes, 19 and three-quarters seconds. In January 1864, some people in Illinois found a horse in the southern part of the state and purchased it for Grant. Because it came from southern Illinois, Grant named the horse Egypt. Here, Jeff Davis, Cincinnati, and Egypt were taken out for a photograph near Grant's headquarters at Petersburg, Virginia in the summer of 1864. General William T. Sherman's best war horse was killed at the Battle of Shiloh in April 1862. Two other horses of Sherman's were killed while being held by an orderly. Of the many horses that Sherman rode through the remaining years of the war, two were favorites, Lexington and Sam. Lexington was a Kentucky thoroughbred. Although he was not the same horse as the racehorse of the same name, he was that racehorse's son. When the Union forces entered Atlanta, Sherman was astride Lexington. He rode that horse in the final review of the Army in Washington, D.C. at the end of the war. Sam was half thoroughbred. A bay, he stood 16 and a half hands and possessed great speed and strength. The horse carried the general from Vicksburg to Atlanta and through the Carolinas. Wounded several times, Sam was calm under fire. He had a rapid gait and could march five miles an hour at a walk. Sam was retired in 1865 to an Illinois farm where he received marked affection. The horse died of old age in 1884. General Philip Sheridan rode a favored horse through much of the war. While stationed at Ray Enzi, Mississippi in the spring of 1862, he obtained a three-year-old horse, 17 hands, powerfully built, with a deep chest, strong shoulders, and great intelligence. He was the strongest horse Sheridan ever rode. He named the horse Rienzi for the town where he was found. After the Battle of Cedar Creek in October 1864, Rienzi's name was changed to Winchester in honor of the town in Northern Virginia from which Sheridan began a ride on that horse that led to the scene of the fighting at Cedar Creek 20 miles south, wrote the poet Thomas Buchanan Reed in his poem, Sheridan's Ride. With foam and with dust, the black charger was gray. By the flash of his eye and his nostrils play, he seemed to the whole great army to say, I have brought you, Sheridan, all the way, from Winchester down to save the day.
Sheridan rode Winchester at the Battle of Five Forks near the war's end when he grabbed his battle flag and dashed ahead charging over the Confederate works. Winchester remained with General Sheridan until he died in his master's stable in Chicago in 1878. A wonderfully preserved Winchester can still be seen in the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C., a gift of General Sheridan. Few horses were more loved by their owners than Old Baldy, the war horse of General George G. Meade. Baldy saw action at the first Battle of Bull Run in July 1861, where his rider was wounded. The bright bay horse with a white face and stockings was turned back to the quartermaster to recover from wounds. In September 1861, General Meade purchased the horse and named him Baldy. He had a rocking gait that was faster than a walk and slow for a trot, causing General Meade's staff officers great consternation keeping up. Baldy's war record was remarkable. Twice wounded at the First Battle of Bull Run, he served through the fighting at Drainsville, Virginia. Two of the seven days of fighting on the peninsula near Richmond in the summer of 1862. Groveton, the Second Battle of Bull Run in August 1862, and South Mountain and Antietam in September. At Antietam, Baldy was actually left on the field assumed dead in the bloody cornfield. In the next Union advance, he was recovered quietly grazing on the battlefield with a dangerous neck wound. Baldy carried Meade through the battles of Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville. At Gettysburg, Baldy was wounded by a bullet that entered between his ribs and lodged there. Meade would not part with a horse, and miraculously, Baldy survived. Baldy was finally turned out to pasture in Downington, Pennsylvania, before the last campaign that ended at Appomattox. At war's end, General Meade hurried back to Philadelphia, where he was reunited with Baldy. They were inseparable companions until 1872, when Meade died. Baldy followed the casket of his master to the grave. When Baldy died in 1882, his head was preserved and displayed in the General George G. Meade post of the Grand Army of the Republic in Philadelphia. It remains in Philadelphia today. Of course, Confederate generals had favorite mounts. Kentuckian General Albert Sidney Johnston, commander of the Confederate Army at Shiloh, was killed there riding his favorite horse, Fire Eater. Fire Eater, a magnificent thoroughbred bay, would stand patiently when bullets and shells rained all around him. When his master ordered him forward, Fire Eater was all fire, hence his name. General Patrick R. Cleburne lost his favorite horse, Dixie, at the Battle of Perryville, Kentucky, the decisive battle of General Bragg's invasion of Kentucky. General J.E.B. Stewart's favorite horse, High Fly, carried him through some of the most desperate moments of his wartime career. In the summer of 1862, while at Verdeersville, on the plank road between Fredericksburg and Orange Courthouse in Virginia, Stuart was stretched out on a bench on the porch of a tavern when his horse stood grazing in a field nearby. Suddenly, Union horsemen dashed around the bend. Quickly mounting high fly, Stuart galloped away, leaving behind his plumed hat. The enemy got Stuart's favorite hat, but high fly was so fast and so strong, the Union cavalrymen had no chance of chasing him and Stuart down. 
General Thomas J. Stonewall Jackson had a favorite battle horse, which at the beginning of the war was 11 years old. Jackson came upon the horse when a train load of Union supplies were captured by his men near Harper's Ferry in May 1861. Jackson purchased the horse from the quartermaster's department and named him Little Sorrel. Little Sorrel carried General Jackson across all the battlefields in the Shenandoah Valley, the peninsula, Second Bull Run, Antietam, and Fredericksburg. Jackson was riding Little Sorrel when he was accidentally shot by his own men at Chancellorsville in May, 1863. Little Sorrel was held in tender esteem long after the war. For years, he was kept at the Virginia Military Institute in Lexington, Virginia the school where his master taught when the war began. Frequently, Little Sorrel was taken to fairs and parades so his many admirers could see him. When Little Sorrel died in 1886, he was lovingly preserved and displayed at the Confederate soldier's home in Richmond, Virginia. You can see him today at the Virginia Military Institute in Lexington, Virginia. His remains were buried on the parade ground. The most famous of all war horses in the Civil War was unquestionably Traveler, the favorite horse of General Robert E. Lee. An iron gray horse, Traveler, was raised in Greenbrier County, Virginia. He was bred in Kentucky, his sire a noted thoroughbred named Gray Eagle. Lee first spotted Traveler when he commanded Confederate forces in the mountains of West Virginia at the beginning of the war. Lee paid $200 for Traveler, who, when he was purchased, was named Jeff Davis. He was gray in color with black spots, a long mane, and flowing tail. He stood 16 hands. He was five years old when Lee acquired him. Traveler's rapid, springy step and big carriage made him conspicuous in camp. On long marches, he carried Lee at five to six miles an hour without faltering. Although Lee had other horses, Lucy Long, Richmond, Ajax, and Brown Roan, Traveler was his favorite. He carried Lee through all the campaigns in Virginia, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. Lee rode Traveler to the McLean House at Appomattox to surrender the Army of Northern Virginia on April 9, 1865. After the war, Lee became president of Washington College in Lexington, Virginia, now Washington and Lee University. Traveler was with his master throughout those years. Lee and Traveler would be seen every day traveling upon the country roads around Lexington. Lee had a remarkably close relationship with his old war horse. Traveler was kept in a stall near Lee's house on campus that still stands and bears a memorial in honor of it being Traveler's last home. Traveler was showered with gifts of saddles, harnesses, oats, and hay throughout his years in Lexington. Some gifts came from as far away as England, Baltimore, and St. Louis. When Lee died in October 1870, Traveler marched behind his master's casket, his slow step and bowed head, almost as if he understood the reason for the occasion. When Traveler died in June 1871, he was buried behind the chapel Lee had built at Washington and Lee. Traveler's bones were exhumed and in 1926 displayed in the chapel. Finally, in 1971, the bones of Traveler were buried alongside the chapel, just five steps from the crypt where his beloved master rests. Traveler's gravestone is showered with coins, flowers, and sentiments from admirers each and every day. Horses were replaced by the internal combustion engine long ago. 
but the memory of them in our Civil War touches the heart. Today, they're remembered with memorials such as this magnificent one in front of the Virginia Historical Society in Richmond. When we see this bronze sculpture of an emaciated and lame mount whose rider may well be dead, just like when we cast a coin or flower on Traveler's Grave, we remember all the horses who sacrificed everything. Those horses were just as courageous and loyal as the soldiers we more often remember. Those horses endured unimaginable hardships, carrying their riders on long raids, pulling guns and wagons through vast territories, and steadfastly facing horrific enemy gunfire. They did all of this on scant rations and minimal rest. I'm sure you'll agree, the horses were the unsung heroes of the American Civil War.